the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. I want to thank you for joining us again uh, for our study of the book of James. Uh, last time we ended around chapter 2, verse 18, and that's where we'll pick up from here. My goal for today is to get to the end of chapter 2 and possibly start chapter 3. That's my big picture goal, and let's see how we can get there. So let's get started for the sake of time. And so if you remember, um, in chapter one, St. James was talking about our status as children of God. And as a result of that, we have certain responsibilities. There's a certain kind of, um, there's a certain consequence that happens uh, when we realize that we are children of God. And we see the connection of our, our daily behaviors and how it's tied to our faith. Right. And so we were, we're diving into chapter two and it's kind of split into two parts where we see a big warning against uh, partiality between worshipers, being careful not to honor the rich. They might not deserve it. Right. There's problems that arise from that. And there's hypocrisy. Um, and it's a very clear warning that we might lose our mercy if, if we if we have that partiality between believers. And then we were switching gears just a little bit. This is where we kind of ended from last time that if we depend on faith without good deeds, uh, it's a big problem. And he started to give us examples of what it means to be dead. What, what is dead faith, right? And so that's kind of where we're at. And so uh, in verse 19, if you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble, right? And so kind of an overconfident brother might think that they're safe because they have faith that God is one, right? And as a good Jew, uh, he confesses to the whole world of the unity of God. And this is a good thing, right? But here we start to talk about um, the second example of a dead faith. And it resembles the devil's faith, right? It's an interesting way to think of it. So to remind you, the first example was 15, and seven, 15 16, and 17 verses, uh, that span of verses, where St. James compared faith without works as a mere kind of talk right? To see someone who's in need and naked, in need of clothing, and we just kind of wish them well, and we don't do anything about it, right? And that kind of, that kind of faith is kind of pointless. It's useless. In the second example here, the person does well, right? Because God is indeed only one, right? And it is a confession of, it's a, it's a true confession of faith. But even the demons could make this same confession, right? And they have the faith that God is one, and they tremble at the thought, right? So we see that obviously more is required than just a simple um, intellectual kind of faith or a cerebral faith, right? It's not good enough. Uh, and just to give you a uh, kind of a more um, direct kind of saying, St. Augustine says, you praise yourself for your faith, right? Be careful. But the devils also believe and tremble. Do they, but do they see God? Only the pure in heart will see God, right? This is in chapter five, Matthew chapter five. Who can say that the devils have pure hearts, right? In spite of that, they believe and tremble. Therefore, they have, there has to be a distinction between our faith and the faith of the devils. Our faith purifies our hearts, but their faith condemns them. They commit evil and still they say, I know you, I know who you are, the only one God, right? This is what St. Peter also says, you are the son of God. Right? And the Lord praised him, but he rebuked the devils. Right? What faith that can purify the heart except the faith which the apostle identified as faith working with love. So faith with work. Okay? So we have to be careful not to have this second type of dead faith. And so St. James illustrates for us two examples of dead faith. Now he's going to give us two examples of living faith, good examples right? Faith that's accompanied with work. And so he starts to talk about Abraham here from verses 20 to 24. And he says, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted for him righteousness right? And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only, right? So St. James challenges his reader directly. He denounces him. He calls him a foolish man, an empty man, right? For his 
Why? Because he has this refusal to repent and to strive for the good works. Why? Because he does not have the works, and that's why he calls him the foolish man. The words foolish man or empty man are used to sort of like poke the reader or to poke the hearer, the unrepentant, to spur them to repentance, right? To, to get them into action. So St. James is basically saying, right, how can he be such a blockhead as not to know that the faith without works is useless? Anyone could know this simply by recalling the example of Abraham, our father, right? And they can see from the story in Genesis chapter 22 that Abraham was justified by, from works. Abraham believed and he was called the friend of God. But how did he obtain this amazing title, right? It was because his works completed his faith. It wasn't enough that he had the faith that God existed, right? No, that faith was perfected and became real in his life only when he obeyed God and offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. And so it was only when faith was co-working with his works that the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham had faith in God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God, right? If Abraham had refused to offer up Isaac and had not done that work, he would not have enjoyed the righteousness and the blessings of being the friend and colleague of God, right? And so the phrase, the phrase, faith was co-working with with works it means that the faith is inseparable from work it is from work that faith is perfected it's fulfilled it's realized it's made real so a man is justified from works not from faith alone for the faith is only truly faith when it produces work okay and then he goes on to give us another example the second example right so in the last couple of verses, we're talking about the examples of true faith, living faith, faith that's accompanied by, by work. First, Abraham. Second, Rahab, right? And he says in verse 25, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Right? And this is an interesting example, right? The proof that faith is only made real through works is proved even more conclusively by the case of Rahab. Right? And her story, the story is told in Joshua chapter 2. Someone might say, oh, you, you can't use Abraham as an example. That's just an exception, right? Um, he was saved by works because he was a man of exceptional righteousness, right? No one can attain that kind of that holiness. So James strategically, wisely mentions the example of the pagan, right? Rahab. And she was not the pillar of righteousness, as we know, like Abraham was, but she was a prostitute. And she was also justified from works when she welcomed the Jewish messengers who, who were spying out the land and, and she sent them on, out by a different way from the one that they came and they, she saved their lives. Rahab came to believe in the Jewish God who is giving Israel victory over the people of Canaan. But simply believing in the Jewish God was not enough, right? She had to express her new loyalty and her faith in a concrete act of hiding the spies from the pursuers and sending them home safely. And so it was only this way that she saved herself and her family and won a place of the cho among the chosen people after the fall of Jericho. And so her new faith in the Jewish God was realized through her work of hiding the Jewish spies. So I love the examples that St. James uses. First, right, Abraham, and second, uh, a pagan, right, the, the, the prostitute Rahab, to show them it doesn't matter, right? We have good examples of, of faith that is accompanying, uh, that works that accompanies the faith. And so we see the relationship of faith with works, right, in chapter, in verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also, okay? And so from the diverse examples of Abraham and Rahab, it's clear that just the body without the spirit is dead. So faith without works is dead. And so what St. James is emphasizing is the importance of works to the extent that he compared it to the relationship between the spirit and the body. One can have a body without breath or spirit, but this is a corpse, and it's no use to anyone. And in the same way, faith without works is not real faith, 
but is equally dead and useless. Faith needs works to be alive, just as the body needs the spirit. And, you know, St. Saint, Saint Athanasius, he said, he called them two sisters, right? He said, faith and works are sisters connected to each other. Whoever believes in God becomes righteous, and whoever is righteous is a believer too. An evil person is away from faith, and whoever forsakes righteousness forsakes the true faith. When a brother helps another, they make shelter to each other. Likewise, when faith and good deeds grow within them, they become well attached too. Thus, the experience of the one is well and good for the other. All right, so he calls faith and work sisters. Right? So Christianity is not a mere philosophy, but it's life in the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I wanted to spend just a second here on, on some people will argue, well, you know, on one hand, we have St. James, you know, talking about faith and works and these kind of things. And if you were to study some of the St. Paul letters, you know, there might seem to be a contradiction between St. Paul and St. James, right? Some argue that St. James and St. Paul are speaking in complete opposition towards each other, or at the very least, at their teachings, right? Their teachings are almost in direct contradiction to each other. This is not the case, and I wanted to spend just a little bit of time here. St. James was writing before St. Paul began his literary work. And so St. James was not writing in contradiction of St. Paul, and St. Paul was not writing to contradict St. James. No, both were addressing separate issues and confronted different and opposite pastoral needs. So when St. Paul wrote that a man is saved by faith and not by works, this is in Romans chapter 3 and in Galatians chapter 2, right? He was striving against those Jews who said that merely being an obedient disciple of Jesus was not enough to be saved. No, you had to, and they insisted, to earn God's favor by performing works of the law, right? And for example, you know, for the Gentile, it was circumcision, right? This was the spirit of the Pharisee, right? The proud determination to earn salvation by your own effort. It's kind of like you're buying your way to heaven, right? So these Jews said that a Gentile could only, could not uh, be truly forgiven and saved as he was, but that he needed to become a circumcised Jew first. For St. Paul, this attitude indicated a complete failure to understand the gospel and involved, you know, subverting everything to make the law superior to the cross. So when James wrote, when St. James wrote that man is saved by works and not by faith, right? He was striving against those Jewish Christians who felt that to be saved, it was sufficient simply to confess the faith. And really that the quality of your life was irrelevant. And for these people, it was a cerebral, it was an intellectual faith. And that was all that was needed. So it didn't really matter that their, you know, discipleship to Jesus was not at all manifested in their daily lives. And so St. James, this attitude indicated, again, a complete failure to understand the gospel. And to those who clung to this attitude were not disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ at all. So St. James and for St. Paul, what saves a man is a heartfelt discipleship towards Christ, right? One is saved by faith and faithfulness, right? Which is a deep relationship of humble love for God. And so this relationship begins when we receive forgiveness as a free gift through Jesus Christ and sustained by a life of repentant striving to please God. So both St. James and St. Paul knew that a love for God is not reflected in, a, in the love for man. And, and this is just an illusion. St. James found this truth under attack by those who said that a life of striving to please God wasn't necessary, right? As long as you gave the intellectual agreement to certain doctrinal truths, right? For example, like the unity of God, like this was enough. So he therefore insisted that one is saved by works so that one's inner faith is shown to be authentic by the quality of one's life, right? St. Paul found this truth under attack by legalists. And they said that this life was not received as a free gift, but needed to be earned by piling up good works, as if you have this scale and you have to keep adding, keep adding the good works 
to um, kind of guarantee a spot for salvation. So he insisted that one is saved by faith, by receiving the forgiveness freely as one comes to God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Neither St. James nor St. Paul contradicted each other, but each protected the same gospel from dis different distortions. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that topic. And then let's move on to chapter three. Um, I, I hope to kind of uh, get a little bit further in chapter three today. Chapter three is, is mainly, you can call the theme, uh, the faith and the tongue, right? So St. James is addressing the, the subject of faith and the tongue. Why? It's to correct some misunderstandings caused by the Jews, right? What are some of the misunderstandings? Like they love teaching and they love talking unwisely. So he's, he wants to correct the tongue here and to be careful and to show us warnings if we're not careful with the tongue. And so we can see the chapter broken down like this. It's not too, um, it's not too involved. Basically, he warns us in verses one and two to be careful of the love of teaching. And then the, primarily the rest of the chapter, it deals with the dangers of the, the tongue, controlling the tongue and, and the wisdom. So we'll see how far we can get today in chapter three, but basically it's, it's really just about the dangers of the tongue. And so he says in verse one, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. And when, you know, when I read this verse, I get, I get very nervous, right? St. James teaches his hearers and, and drives them to humility, right? Um, many among them, they really were leaning towards arrogance and some sought after teaching, right? Um, this office of teaching, thinking that becoming a teacher in the church would make them even more prominent. And their desire to become teachers was not motivated by a love, right? A love of the wisdom and a love of, you know, this desire to spread the gospel. It, it wasn't about that. It was more motivated by a love of status, right? And a desire to dominate. So the, the office of the teacher was common. You can even reference Acts chapter 13, verse 1. And even um, if you remember in, in 1 Timothy, uh, teaching along with ruling was one of the tasks of the elders or the priests and the elders who who labored hard at it were counted worthy of double honor right this is first timothy chapter five and so the office of teacher and priest tended to coincide in fact saint paul refers to both shepherds and teachers in the same breath in ephesians chapter four probably because both roles were filled by the same man and so you have to understand, especially in a, in a Jewish context, with its cultural respect for the rabbi, right? The office of teacher was a prestigious one. And it was not surprising that those who loved the praise of man gravitated towards it. And so St. James warns against many becoming teachers, knowing that a number of them are motivated by a desire for status. And so he warns them, reminding them that teachers like himself Right? He is part of the we, you know, um, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So he understands and he's communicating that we um, will receive a, a, a more strict judgment. You know, the words, the words for um, more judgment can also be uh, understood as stricter judgment or, or even more condemnation. So teachers' words affect many, right? And if our teachings are misleading, then many, many can, you know, suffer a, a big harm. And that's the reason why they will incur more judgment on the last day. So dead faith without works drives someone to appear in the form of a teacher. And so one can increase his talk and rebuke others without any kind of inner, inner reflection. And that is why the church requires that even the priest, the clergy, even to the Pope, right? That they have fathers of confession. So they don't forget their spiritual growth during their ministry. And they don't, they don't forget their discipleship. And so St. James, sorry, St. Paul is advising uh, St. Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. So be careful, you know. Even during the liturgy, the priest 
he, the church teaches us that, that the priest prays for his sins while standing before the altar, asking for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. You know, St. Augustine gives us a, a big warning. He says, as stewards of God, we guard you, but we also would like God to guard us. Since we are your shepherds, yet we are still under God's care, for we are, meanwhile, sheep and your companions. Regarding God, he is the one master, and we are students of his school. And if we want, if we want God, who humbled himself, to guard us, then let us humble ourselves so no one thinks that he is something. Every good thing in us is from God who is full of goodness. These are very wise words for us to remember for any of us that become teachers, Sunday school teachers, and these kind of this responsibility in our service. And he says in verse two, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in the word, he is a perfect man, also able also to bridle the whole body. So pride has driven some clergymen and some people to think that they are good and sin no more and have to be and, and, and have to be saved. That is why St. James says, for we all stumble in many things. It, it, it's an acknowledgement, it's a humility. Um, St. James continues this warning against the arrogance, and he tries to warn his hearers from becoming teachers. And St. James points out that the teacher depends on the spoken word. And this, he says, shows how dangerous the teaching office can be. For all people trip up in many ways, and the one who does not trip up in what he says is a perfect man, able to bridle not only his tongue, but his whole body also. In our fallen state, we are all prone to sin, and especially with the tongue. The, the tongue is usually the last member to be tamed. You know, the one who cannot bridle his, his tongue cannot control the body, you know, which represents his life. But whoever can control the tongue is a perfect man. And that means they have spiritual maturity, right? And if we think of the sins of speech, like gossip and slander and, you know, verbal abuse and angry talk, right? It's really hard to eradicate. It's really hard to tackle those, those sins. Success in this is usually a sign of someone who's becoming perfect, who is becoming spiritually mature. Control of the tongue is pivotal, right? Because that little member is responsible for so much damage, right? Um, and the scripture says, many have fallen by the edge of the sword, but not so many as have fallen because of the tongue, right? St. John Kalamakis, he says some really um, bold words here. He says, abundant talk is the throne of bragging. From his throne, from this throne, the love of the ego and pride appears. Abundant talk is a sign of ignorance, which leads to foolish laugh, coarse jesting, lying, and hypocrisy. It leads to sleep and lack of concentration and memory. It cools the heat of the spirituality and makes our prayers lukewarm and not fervent. So we have to struggle to, to we have to strive for perfection, which means not to stumble in word. And let's continue. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body, right? You know, some might think this is an exaggerated, exaggerated claim, but St. James supports it with examples to show that a small thing can have a huge effect. If we can put the bits into the horse's mouth, we can make, we can make them obey us, and, and we can guide their whole bodies even though the horse is much larger and more powerful than a man. And so a bit, even though it's little, can have a, a strong effect. The bits do not turn the whole head, but the whole body, right? Which means the whole behavior. So let's, let's think about what, our, what, it, it, what it says in Psalm 39, verse 1. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me, right? Why? So that our bodies may not fall like the horses and the human soul is destroyed. And let's go on to verses four and five. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder 
and whenever the pilot desire, wherever this pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. The same principle is seen in, in ships also. Though ships are so great and driven by hard winds, right, they appear to be unstoppable. They can be guided by a very small rudder so that the whole huge ship goes wherever the impulse of the one who is steering wants, right? The captain of the ship drives the ship by a small rudder. And when the captain abuses that rudder, he loses the whole ship, right? Think of the different examples of, of people that abused this rudder, so to speak. Think of Nebuchadnezzar, right? right? He abused the rudder, he abused his tongue, and he glorified himself, right? He said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my own mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? This is Daniel chapter 4. And he suffered very bitterly. Same with Herod. Because of a small rudder, the people shouted the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately the angel of the Lord struck him, and he was eaten by worms and died. This is written in Acts chapter 12. Also, because of one word, St. Peter wept bitterly. Again, the point is, we can see what great results can come from something so small, right? It is the same thing with the tongue. Even though it is a little part of the body, it can boast great things, being able to inflict untold damage, okay? Um, let's continue, and I think I'll end around here. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest, a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And the tongue is so set among our members that it defies, it, it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. This is verses five and six. Anyone can see from this, for all, you know, for all know that how a campfire, you know, even though it's small, it can, it can cause what? A great forest fire. A small spark can burn a whole forest. So the warning is clear. The tongue is that spark. And if we're, all, if we're not careful, it may set on fire the whole body. And then one loses his ability to pray. And it causes division. And it stirs hatred. And it causes someone to lose their inner and outer peace. Right? So St. James says that the tongue is a fire and it can spread destruction all around. It is a complete world of unrighteousness, containing within itself a vast array of sin and having a crucial role to play in all the evil in the world. In our fallen state, the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the whole body, right? That is, when we consider our bodily life, we see that the tongue is a member responsible for our destruction and if we're not careful. And so I, I think I'll start, I'll stop there for the sake of time today. And glory be to God forever. Amen. And I can